Hello and welcome into the Bradley Basketball pregame show with Mitch Kaminsky and Larry Larson. I'm Joey Wright. Coming up later in the show, we'll have women's basketball analysis for you. But for now, us three are counting you down to the men's basketball game versus U of I Chicago. And guys, before we hop into that, I want to go back and talk about Bradley's win against IUPUI. Big win on Saturday night. Larry, we'll start with you. Your takeaways from the IUPUI win. I think this is pretty much the perfect bounce back after that St. Joe's loss, Joey. The, they couldn't have performed any better. Elijah Childs getting into the 20-point range, uh, all starters and double figures. I think it was a really good confidence boost, and they did what they needed to do at home. Mm -hmm. A small win, a less than 10-point win, wouldn't have done it, mm -hmm. but they blew them out, and I think that's what they needed to do, and they did it. Well, one of the big things that stood out to me was defense is a problem against St. Joe's at times. I think they struggled to defend the paint because they're so worried about the three ball, so that opened up a lot of lanes. But in this one against IUPUI, the defense was phenomenal. They held them to 35% shooting. And like you said, everyone got involved up and down the lineup. All five starters were in double figures. The bench got involved. Uh, I think it was a great overall team win uh, and a big confidence booster moving forward. Absolutely, and I want to go back and talk a little bit about depth because depth to some was a question mark for this team this season, but I think they proved on Saturday night that there are some guys deep on the bench that can step up and make plays when they have to. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that depth is really only going to be a focus in the, in the front court, and that's where we see Koch Barr step up. That's where we see Deshaun Henry, who didn't even play uh, the other night, step up, and Elijah Childs playing the stretch five at times. I think they can take care of business. We saw Elijah Childs do really well in the post against IUPUI, and I think that's a really good sign of things to come. He had that hook shot going. Could be dangerous. I also like the way the pace uh, these guys played with throughout the game. I think it was a nice up-tempo. The ball movement was phenomenal. On both sides of it, even when you got uh, the bench came in, too, Koch Barr really stepped up this game, as you were saying. And Dale Brown did a nice job of uh, dis distributing the ball on offense. He had 10 assists. That matched a career high for him. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't really scoring early, but he found a way to get others involved, and the scoring came later in the game, which is really nice to see. So a good win against IUPUI and a good bounce back because they fell uh, to IUPUI last season. They also lost at Chicago, uh, U of I Chicago. So sort of a rematch of sorts coming up at Carver this Saturday. And what can we expect from the Braves in that one, Larry? I think they're definitely going to come out hungry like uh -huh. they came out in the IUPUI game. Uh, those two losses to those Horizon League teams were quadrant four losses. And I think those lead to, you know, of course, higher seeds in the NBC mm -hmm. tournament as in they got the 15 seed and had to play number two seed Michigan State. So if Bradley finds himself in that position again this year in the hunt for a tournament spot, they're going to want to beat teams uh -huh. like IUPUI and UIC. They already took, took care of business against the Jaguars. Now they got to do it against the Flames. And honestly, I, I like their chances. Mm -hmm. With UIC, I think th this is a team they definitely should be able to beat, but it's going to be a sneaky game because UIC – they have three returning seniors, all who had 1,000 points uh, overall in their career. Um, they're one of the most experienced teams in the Horizon League uh, to go along with that. So they're a sneaky team. Uh, a lot of people expect them to make the tournament this year if they can win the league. Now, mind you, they're coming off a really tough loss to Memphis, and then they got mauled by Ball State. And, man, imagine losing to Ball State. Uh, <laughs> I kid. But so they're going to be coming in hungry because they had two ugly losses uh, before this one. So this could be a trap game for the Braves at home. So you want to come out uh, ready to play. Yeah, I, I would agree with uh -huh. Mitch. Uh, looking at their roster, the one player that stands out to me, Tarkus Ferguson, he had a great game last year against the Braves in Chicago. And that Daryl brown Tarkus Ferguson matchup is going to be one to watch. Yeah, he led the team in assists and points last year. So that's going to be definitely a, that'll be a fun one to watch for sure. Yeah, certainly a matchup to look forward to. And Larry, you talked about quadrant four losses. Uh, but this non-conference schedule for Bradley, really, I mean, it could favor them if they could get hot because you look at they've got Memphis on the schedule later this season, and Memphis looks pretty good right now. Some some action coming up. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if Bradley can, can get hot, start getting some wins, this non-conference schedule could favor them if they can start taking care of business. Yeah, absolutely. If they keep up this momentum, they're going to be in really good shape. Last year we saw them come out, do really well the first few non-conference games. I believe they start 5-0 and or something mm -hmm. like that, 6-1, and won the Cancun Challenge. But after that, things start heading south. That's where they have to keep the momentum right. is into conference because they started to slide a little bit heading into MVC play, and then they started MVC play 0-5. But, of course, it all works out. However, um, I think you got to keep that momentum going throughout the season. Like we said, with MVC seeding, mm -hmm. having a great non-conference resume helps, and I think their schedule is set up for that this year. 
certainly. I totally agree with that. And I think the one tough game that really stands out is uh, when they play Memphis on the road. But I think that's a winnable game for them. Um, um, it doesn't look great, but yeah, Memphis is dealing with that circus with Wiseman and all that media coverage. Then, as we saw, it was Evansville. They went to Kentucky in Rupp Arena, and they pulled out the victory. I got the Evansville purple on today. Valley <laughs> runs deep, and I'm not talking about the Ohio Valley. So... You know, you get some momentum there, build some confidence, and you're coming into a game like that that I think is very winnable. And like you said, that would look very good for the resume to boost it. And the, like I was talking about, the Valley's are very competitive this year. It runs mm -hmm. deep, so you definitely want to have a good uh, momentum heading into conference play because it's going to be tough. It's one of the deeper conferences I've seen in a while. Yeah, to add on that, the Valley's just going to be up in the air this year. <laughs> yeah. So like Mitch said, this non-conference play is going to be so important mm -hmm. because I feel like there's going to be a lot of games in the Valley this year where teams just beat up on each other. Uh, it's going to be one of those conferences where you know teams get eaten alive, so to speak, in conference. And they could be great on paper and outside conference, but once you get in the conference, you pick up three, four, or five losses. That's when you know the committee for the NCAA starts to look at your record and go, well, you know, maybe they can be a lower seed. Yeah. But that's why non-conference is so important. And Evansville is like a team that a lot of people projected in the middle of the standings to the Valley, and now it just shows you can't take any nights off against these guys. Even like a team like Southern Illinois, you take a night off against them, it's going to come back to bite you, so you got to bring it every night. Well, and you'll recall last year against Kentucky, Southern Illinois, I mean, they led at one point. Yep. They gave them a game, so certainly these Valley teams... You don't want to take them lightly. Yeah, I don't know why Kentucky scheduled another Valley <laughs> team, probably because Walter McCarty went to Kentucky, yeah. but I just don't think that was a good move. I mean, obviously Kentucky a very good ball club, but their inexperience showed the other night, and Evansville's experience showed. I picked them eighth in my predictions for the Valley, but they've got some pieces. K.J. Riley looked really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. um, San Cunliffe looked really good. Hit so many threes, and... You know, he's coming from Kansas and Arizona State before that. So a lot of guys on that roster have experience, and that's what really matters in mid-major basketball is if you've got experience, especially at the guard position, you could win a lot of games. And it showed because they came in there and they didn't look scared at all. A lot of teams would be intimidated by that, especially if they had a lead in the second half, and then Kentucky kind of went on a run there to close the gap and take the lead. And it's like, uh-oh, here it comes. But they didn't flinch. They kept they kept with it, and they, yeah, they did not look intimidated or scared at all on a tough road environment, and it really showed. Yeah, Larry, I think Evansville read your preview. That fired them up. <laughs> yeah, they must have, so honestly. Bulletin board material. Yeah, exactly. Well, all I'm right. I'm sure they read the Bradley Scott. I'm sure they do. <laughs> Who does? BradleyScott.com. Yeah. So you can read it anywhere. All right, guys. Well, we're going to kick it out to Cameron Irwin. Uh, Cameron Irwin with predictions for the Missouri Valley Conference uh, this coming weekend. So let's see what Cameron has in terms of his Valley picks. Hi, I'm Cameron Irwin here at Renaissance Coliseum on the campus of Bradley University as yet another week of MVC basketball is ready to begin. I'm here with my picks for the week, beginning first with the San Francisco Dons visiting the Southern Illinois Saluki. Now the San Francisco Dons lost their leading scorer last year but are returning Charles Mineland averaging about 15 points per game and leading this Dons team. They also add Khalil Shabazz from Central Washington who's coming off the bench providing a spark for them and their 7 foot rebounder Jimbo Lowell returns as well. And as for Southern Illinois, they lose all four of their double-digit scores, but add two graduate transfers in Ronnie Suggs Jr. from Missouri and Benson from Northwestern. Now, Southern Illinois was the third seed in last year's MVC Conference Tournament, but once again, their scoring dropped off. I expect San Francisco to pick up the win in Carbondale this weekend. Up next, we have the University of Central Florida visiting the Illinois State Redbirds just about 45 minutes east of here in Bloomington, Illinois. Now, University of Central Florida, we know they lost Taco Fall. You know, he's the headline of the NBA right now with his size, but they also lost Aubrey Dawkins, their leading scorer. They returned one starter in Colin Smith. That's not going to be enough for UCF to get it done. Illinois State did lose Yarborough and Phil Fain last year, but Zach Copeland has really stepped up, averaging nearly 20 points, and J.C. Hillsman as well from San Jose State University has added a spark to this Illinois State team. I expect the Redbirds to come out on top against UCF. Now the game of the week this week in St. Joe's visiting the Loyola Ramblers. Now Loyola lost Clayton Custer and Marcus Towns, two of the most influential players on that team that made the run to the NCAA tournament a couple years ago. But Cameron Crutwig is still there, named the MVC preseason player of the year. Lucas Williamson was also on that preseason third team, but it's been Tate Hall who stepped up in the starting lineup this season. Williamson has been a little bit of inconsistent. Loyola's going to need him to step up eventually if they want to find that sense of identity that they've lost. In addition, they've had a little bit of turnover in the lineup. Jalen Pipkin 
as well as Marquise Kennedy, they've been in and out of the starting lineup this season. Loyola dropped the game to Coppin State. They were 22-point favorites, ended up losing that one. They also lost to the University of Indianapolis in an exhibition this year by five points. Now Loyola, once again, they've lost that sense of identity. They're going to need to bounce back soon enough. I don't think it'll be this game. St. Joe's beat Bradley in the opener this season by five. Ryan Daly, the transfer from Delaware, put up 26 points. Miles Douglas, the transfer from the University of Central Florida, had 18 in that game. Those two are going to have to be huge for St. Joe's to come out on top against Loyola. St. Joe's is going to have to control the boards, too. It's the reason they lost to Old Dominion. I see the Hawks coming out on top against a struggling Loyola team this weekend. These have been my picks for the weekend, but be sure to keep an eye around the Valley as this young basketball season continues. Thank you, Cameron. Guys, let's get into our own predictions. We will start with that uh, St. Joe's Loyola game. I've got St. Joe's. How about you guys? I've got Loyola for an upset of sorts <laughs> here. Bradley had a close loss to St. Joe's, mm -hmm. so St. Joe's isn't unbeatable. However, they look a lot better. Mm -hmm. They were picked in the A-10 poll to start the season, but then they went on the road and had a really, really nice mm -hmm. win the other night. And so it's hard to pick against them, but Loyola have struggled early on, and I really think they want to prove themselves and establish themselves in non-conference play. They haven't looked good. Uh, they've picked up some injuries over the offseason, but Cameron Crutwig, Lucas Williamson, they need to step up if they want to win this game, but I've got Loyola, surprisingly. Joey, great pick. Loyola screwed me last week. I picked them to win. They didn't deliver. And, you know, St. Joe's, they beat Bradley, so they got to be decent. I'm rolling with them simply for that fact. So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take St. Joe's over the Ramblers. Sure. All right, next game, San Francisco and Southern Illinois. San Francisco, a lot of people high on the Dons this year. They were a powerhouse in the 50s looking to get back to that. I've got San Francisco. I've got San Francisco as well, Joey, seeing – them having to travel to Southern Illinois shouldn't be much of a problem. They're probably going to pack the house down there in Carbondale. However, San Francisco looked really good in that pretty solid WCC last year, West Coast Conference. They finished third to Gonzaga and a number of other teams. St. Mary's also in that conference. So they play some staunch conference competition. They've got a number of returning guys, um, and I think they've got a solid team, and they probably shouldn't have an issue with Southern Illinois. San Francisco has the winningest team in West Coast Conference history. Does that have anything to do with this pick? Not really, but I think I like the stat. Uh, but like you were talking about, they have a lot of experience, which is going to help because they're coming into uh, the unveiling of the Bandera Center in Southern Illinois. So they're going to have to spoil that event, but I think their experience is going to ruin the night for the Salukis, and I'm taking San Francisco to win. Yep, and as, as we mentioned, uh, San Francisco, a powerhouse back in the day, one of college basketball's good early programs. That's right. So uh, certainly some history in that matchup. And then our... Final game to look at, Illinois State and Central Florida. Central Florida losing a lot of guys this year. I, 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 I'm high on the Redbirds, uh, if I can spit that out. Yeah, <laughs> surprisingly, I'm high on the Redbirds as well. You know, our friends, friends down I-74, <laughs> they've had a really good uh, non-conference season so far. That win over Little Rock looks solid, especially after Little Rock beat Missouri State. Mm -hmm. And then that win over Belmont was just really solid. I can't get over how well they've played early in the season. They picked up another win the other night. It's really hard to pick against the Redbirds right now. And, you know, as much as it pains me to say it, they could win a lot of games in the Valley this year. Yeah, they look sneaky good right now. Uh, and UCF, they lost 80% of their scoring from last season. Mm -hmm. So that's hard to replace. You had Taco Fall, who was taking up all the space in the middle. He's now gone. You can't really replace a seven-foot tall guy like that. Um, and like we were talking about, Illinois State, they look dangerous this year. I think UCF's going to come out a little flat. It's a Sunday afternoon game. By the end, they're going to wish they were watching the Jaguars or whoever they watch down there. <laughs> Illinois State's going to win this one. And UCF losing, as Mitch mentioned, all five of their starters, not just 80% of the scoring, yeah. but that's a lot of experience <laughs> to lose. You know, of course, the Redbirds in a similar situation. They bring back a few guys, like Zach Copeland, namely, but they lost uh, Malik Yarborough and a uh, number of other big names, but they've uh, they've managed. Yep, certainly. See how it all plays out. And then Bradley and UIC. We won't make any uh, game predictions for that one, but I do want to know, guys, who are your picks to click, if you will? Who steps up for Bradley and has a big game against the Flames? So, as I mentioned earlier, um, that Targus ferguson Daryl Brown matchup is going to be big. Mm -hmm. So I've got Daryl Brown. Uh, he's got to be really solid on defense. Uh, we saw what he can do distributing the ball the other night, 10 assists, had a double-double. Um, as Mitch mentioned, career high for him. That's a really good sign. Now that Bradley brings in 
Danny A. Kingsby alongside Brown in the backcourt. Brown can be more of a true point guard. We're going to see a lot more of him passing the ball, a lot less of him you know, having to step up and score the ball as much as he has in the past. I think he's going to be a lot more of a distributor, and honestly, I wouldn't be shocked to see a lot of 10 assist games from DB this year, so he's my pick to click. Sure. When you look at last game's box store score, the one player that jumped out was Elijah Childs, obviously. He had the double-double. He had the big dunk. He was mean-mugging people, which I love. I love the swagger there. But the one guy that had a sneaky good game was Koch Barr. He was in double figures. He was stroking, and all of a sudden he has a jump shot. A lot of people were like, he, he gets a lot of flack, like, oh, he can't catch the ball. I don't know about that, because when he does get the ball down there, he's a monster. It's hard to defend him. You can't really hack a shack with him either, because he's making his free throws. And with that jump shot now from mid-range, if he can expend the floor like that and consistently show he can do that, that's going to be a scary player to watch. He's had two solid games. I'm looking for another big game from him today. Certainly. Koch and Daryl. Players to watch, guys. We're about to go out to Renaissance Coliseum for some women's basketball analysis. But first, any final thoughts? Anything we've talked about? Well, we've talked about a lot. We have we've covered, we have a lot. covered a lot. <laughs> um, but all things considered, we talked about the non-conference schedule. I like Bradley's mm -hmm. non-conference schedule. And as of late, these teams that Bradley has played picked up wins. St. Joe's with a big win on the road the other night. IUPUI, after the Bradley loss, went on the road and beat Southern Florida. Who saw that coming? And then Northwestern on the schedule later on, and they just beat Providence. Mm -hmm. So Bradley's uh, schedule looking stronger and stronger as the non-conference slate goes on. I think that's a really good sign. I think the one thing that stands out about this Braves team is they're very young, so it's going to be important to get these wins early. Especially, I'd like to see a close game, and so they teach them how to win early until they get to those important conference games. That's something you need to do. Uh, they were in a close one the first one, and that's a tough road environment there. Mm -hmm. But um, I think good, this is going to be a good experience for a lot of these uh, younger players here as they continue to develop throughout the season. Certainly, and the crowd at Carver Arena should be good on Saturday night when the Braves take on the Flames of Illinois Chicago. So, guys... That'll do it for us out to Renaissance Coliseum for our women's basketball crew. Let's hear what they had to say. Welcome to the Braves Vision pregame show. We're coming to you from Renaissance Coliseum here in Peoria, Illinois, on the campus of Bradley University. Joining me is Joey Wright, Ronan Kalsa, and Brock Stoddard. So, boys, we are into an early season so far with the Bradley Braves. A lot of things to digest. What are some quick points that you guys have? Joey, if you want to go first. Yeah, Bradley here, uh, one and one uh, through their first two games and a a big match uh, against Eureka here on Saturday, but they've played good competition. Uh, Oakland and Michigan guys, and I think that a win against Oakland, loss against Michigan, but Michigan's ranked. I think a lot of positive takeaways from the Braves' first two games of the season. Yeah, really showed a great defensive effort, according to Gorski, and I agree with her. Um, you know, able to out-rebound Oakland. Oakland's a bigger team, so able to able to get there. Um, a lot of players from Michigan on the team this year. Um, Gorski's that's where she kind of got her start in coaching, playing number 24. Um, you know, Michigan Wolverines at home. So that's always going to be tough to play Purdue last year. It's really nice that they're able to get that connection to the Big Ten in the non-conference for the last three years. I just think it's important for Bradley to have good opponents like that because it prepares them for the rest because there's some good players here in the Valley, and if they are used to playing size and talent from Michigan, then they should be well-suited to have to deal with the players from Drake and the other good, talented players that are in the Valley. Yeah, M Missouri State and um, Drake are considered to be you know, in the top 30, which is really something to look out for. And that game against Michigan really helped them prepare for the size that those two teams bring in the Valley. Yeah, Joey, looked like you had a point. Yeah, I just wanted to hop on the, the Michigan uh, comment a little further because you mentioned that's where Coach Gorski's from. That's also where the Petrie sisters are from, Mari and Laisha. So just sort of nice for Bradley to go on the road to Michigan uh, to start the season. You know, Some sentimental vibes going on there, and they, they were able to get a win. So a good start to the season there yeah. going where uh, they're familiar territory. Yeah, and Leisha said that you know a bunch of people flew in from California, from the south, all the states down there, um, to support Mari and herself, which is really great to see um, you know, back in their stopping grounds. Yeah, and going off of that, like you guys said, it is important to have these high-quality opponents early in the season to get you good looks for the conference season. Looking at the Valley Conference, what are kind of, uh, some standouts, maybe players, teams, that you guys are kind of keeping an eye on as we get underway this year? Uh, I think first off, uh, for you and I, Carly Rucker's had an unbelievable start to the season. She's had two 20-point games, uh, all three in double figures. For a UNI team that looks pretty tough, uh, Megan Maz down low is another great player. So, I mean, I think they're going to be tough this year. Yeah, you and I, always tough. Uh, Drake, always tough. Really, probably the two best players are on Drake. 
Um, Missouri State, you know, made the Sweet 16 last year, have a new coach um, from Michigan State, who's associate head coach of Michigan State um, last year, and they haven't taken a step back. It's really those top four with Bradley, including those top four. The other teams, you know, we'll see how they do, but yeah, the Valley's tough all, all the way, every year, top to bottom. And Evansville, even though they're picked 10th, you know, they can, they can shoot it from behind the arc. And Illinois State at, at number six in the preseason poll. They've got a good chance to make a statement against Illinois this week. So, you know, the Valley is just such a deep conference. You look at men's and women's basketball. Really, it's, I mean, it's just so wide open. And, and you mentioned you and I, Drake, and, and uh, Missouri State. But Bradley, you know, grouped right along with them. So I think those, those four teams are going to be the teams to watch. It's going to be, you know, when we get into the conference tournament, I think we're really going to find out who the, who the real team is. And you guys really hit it on the head. A lot of the upper echelon of the conference, it's really like picking, you know, names out of a hat, really, on who's going to be there and, uh, and for the seating of the conference tournament. So going ahead to some of those specific teams, we had Illinois State coming up. You guys mentioned you and I and Drake as well. Um, what, are some of some, what are some things uh, specifically from them that you guys really uh, kind of take note of? I would say the size. That all those three teams you mentioned have size. And size plays in women's basketball. The bigger you are, the more you can get down in the paint. I think the big takeaway is that they all have people who can score. I mean, for Drake, you have Sarah Ryan and Becca Hittner, who's the two-time conference player of the year back-to-back -back for a reason. She can score. For you and I, you have uh, Carly Rucker, Megan Maz, uh, and then, yeah. So, I mean, they're just scores. People score. They have size, like you mentioned. So, it's going to be tough. I mean, they're going to challenge Bradley as well. But I think, like, like we said, the Michigan test early in the season was a good way for them to gauge their progress this season and see what they have to work on. Scoring and size, I don't know if there's anything left for me. I mean, that's two, two big things right there. But, yeah, I mean, to win in the Valley, you've got to be balanced. You've got to have size down low. And then you've also got to have girls that you can kick it out to on the perimeter and, and knock them down. Uh, and I think that all, all the teams we discussed have that. Yeah, I think you guys hit excellent points there. Now, looking at those three teams specifically, all having big games coming up, starting with, uh, I believe we'll start with Drake and Creighton, uh, former MVC foe, a lot of history there. What are some thoughts on that game for you guys? Uh, I, for Creighton, you know, they lost senior Aubrey Faber last year, so they're going to have to look to a new cast. I think they're going to rely on uh, seniors Agnew and Peoria native Olivia, senior Olivia Elger. And then as well, I think Tammy Carta is a name that could be, provide huge for the Braves. She's a junior this year. She scored double figures last year, scored 25 in their second game against Omaha, so she could look to take a big jump this year as well. The way I see it is Creighton beat South Dakota State. South Dakota State beat Drake. Creighton's going to win the game. I'm going with Drake. I think Drake, you know, they've, they've gotten some looks in the top 25 poll. I just think Drake's good team. It's a good test for them early on in the year, but I like the Bulldogs to come out and get the win. Like he was saying, though, Creighton balance scoring. I think that balance scoring is going to show out um, at Drake, you know, because they have the two best players probably in the Valley. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, it's the depth that's really going to – take Creighton over the hump. It is a uh, Missouri Valley Conference, I'm trying to think of the word, I, rematch of sorts because Creighton, of course, was in the Valley for, for the longest time. So two programs who, they're somewhat familiar with each other. You Perhaps know. a revisit. Yeah, a revisit would be a good word. You know, they've played each other in the past, know each other a little bit. Now, of course, you can't base this matchup off what happened in 2010, but uh, it's going to be interesting. I think Drake comes out and gets the win, though. All right, moving on, we have another in-state, um, or excuse me, we have our first in-state matchup between Illinois and Illinois State. Illinois out of the Big Ten, Illinois State, of course, from the Valley. Um, some people view this as kind of, you know, a bad blood match. Um, what are some points you guys have also coming there? I'll hop in here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Illinois State in this one. I, I, like, I like the Redbirds to come in and pull off. Uh, you could call it an upset, but I don't think so, because look at Illinois. Since Nancy Fahey took the reins a few years ago, things just haven't clicked for the uh, Illini, and they only won two Big Ten games last year. Now, I know Illinois State was picked sixth in the Valley preseason poll, but, you know, this is a, this is a game you got marked on your calendar. A good chance to come out and make a statement against Illinois Big Ten team. So I like the Redbirds. I think they're going to come out strong and uh, take the State Farm Center in Champaign by storm. You know, Illinois State's had a tough non-conference Tate Maggot um, f picked the first team, preseason f first team. Um, she's really the only player that poses any difficulty to defenses, I think. So Illinois is going to win. I have Illinois as well. They have two 6'2 uh, forwards, senior Allie Andrews, who's coming off back-to-back, -back, who scored double figures in both her games. And then freshman forward uh, Kylie Kylie. It's all you, Kevin. Got to edit. Pretty good. We got 
get that all in one take tonight. Uh, freshman Kennedy Miles as well. She comes out of Walnut, Walnut Hills High School in Ohio. She was a two-time conference player of the year uh, in high school and as well as an All-State honorable mention nominee. So I think she, so, and she, she had a double-double in her first college game, and she nearly missed one in her second. So that's pretty good production for such a young player. So I think that's going to bode well for Illini down the stretch. Look, I'm from Urbana. I, I know Illinois, and, and I'm aware of the uh, team on my mic flag, but I've got to back the birds in this one. I think it's just it's a good chance for them to come out and get an early win, a statement win. You know, regardless of Illinois could be undefeated in the Big Ten or winless in the Big Ten, it's still Illinois, still a team you want to beat, big spotlight. I like Illinois State to come out and get the job done. I also had Illinois picked in this game, and going back to the previous one, which I forgot to mention, I had Drake picked as well. Um, now coming into our third and final game, as a guy from Iowa, this is a big matchup in the state of Iowa. Don't let anyone tell you different. There's state bragging rights as Drake, you and I, Iowa and Iowa State usually all play each other in the non-conference for bragging rights. And you and I so far has done two of the three right now. And they'll be taking on Iowa here coming up. So you and I and Iowa in, uh, excuse me, at you and I, what are uh, some points and emphasis that you guys have there? I think one of the big things you worry about is, you know, you graduate and you have such a good team and you graduate talent, what's it going to be like? The next year, Iowa went to the Elite Eight last year, was one of the best teams in the country, had one of the best, if not the best player in the country in Megan Gustafson. She's gone. She's drafted. She got picked by the Dallas Wings in the 2019 draft. You lost Tanya Davis as well as Hannah Stewart. The only player they really have left is Kathleen Doyle, but she stepped up so far in early for Iowa. I have them, pick, I have them defeating uh, Northern Iowa. I'm going to agree with you, Brock. You know, Doyle. Pick to first team, the coaches poll and the media poll. Mm -hmm. um, she's gonna really just bring Iowa up there and and beat Northern Iowa. Yeah, no such uh, Valley Big Ten upsets here. I, I like Iowa in this one for the reasons that you guys mentioned. And we're gonna make it a four peat sweep with the Hawkeyes. I took Iowa as well on the road against UNI as Iowa will stop UNI streak to be the uh, in-state favorite. We should say there. Any uh, last points from you guys here? I mean, you and I is, is a legit team, though, so it'll be a close, hard-fought game. It's not going to be a blowout, I don't think. Yeah, it's one of those matchups where, you know, you pick one team, Iowa in this case, but you're not surprised if, if Iowa, Northern Iowa, I should say, can come out and pull off the win. So if it's close, if it's within 10 points, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, especially, yeah, with the, with much of the talent they have. I mean, with Carly Rucker and Megan Moss, I mean, it's, it's not going to be a pushover game. I mean, Iowa's got to take it seriously. They can't just come in thinking they're going to roll them because they're in the Valley. They are a legitimate opponent. And it, it should be a good game. I don't think it'll be a blowout by any means, but I do think that Iowa has the edge. All great points. And you guys here to hear first on the Braves Vision pregame show live from, or excuse me, from Renaissance Coliseum here in Peoria, Illinois, on the campus of Bradley University. So looking now at the Bradley schedule, they have Eureka and Western coming up. What are some maybe uh, players that you guys have coming down the stretch for this game that you guys really see as impact players? I'm going to focus first on the Eureka game, and my pick to click is going to be Tatum Koenig, point guard for the Braves. Did not have a phenomenal game statistically against Michigan, so I look at this Eureka game as a good chance for her to kind of get back on track. Uh, I don't want to say lesser opponent because Eureka, in terms of uh, Division Three teams, not bad uh, by any means, but... Good chance to get back on track, a game that Bradley should win easily. So I, I like Kane to come out and just kind of get the fundamentals back down and, and get back on track. Yeah, Eureka, D3 team, not a lot of height. So I got Emily Marsh coming off the bench. Um, she can get down there, R Ronnie Roberts, but I'm going to go with Emily Marsh. But Roberts is a freshman. And Marsh coming back, from, um, coming back into practice these last couple of weeks, had a little bit of a foot injury. Um, so see what she can do and, and really assert herself down low. My pick is Gabby Hawk. She has, she's had a tough start to the season in terms of shooting the ball, and I just think she's just such a good scorer. I don't see that that continuing, and I think what better way than to get yourself back on track than against a D3 opponent, you know, just come in here. Sh we're at home. We're at home, right? At home in the Renaissance Coliseum. Friendly rims. You shoot at them every day in practice. I think that's, gonna, that's really going to help her out. All right, now looking ahead to Western coming up on the schedule for Bradley, uh, what are some maybe picks that you guys are – just maybe not familiar with that maybe people should know of coming out in that game? Uh, it's Wednesday. Um, not a lot of Wednesday games for the bas for women's basketball, at least. Um, see what they can do in the midweek. Western, you know, Ohio Valley School, uh, nothing too special, but it'll be closer than Eureka after Bradley gets a little tune-up game against Eureka here on Saturday. Yeah, it's a rematch. Uh, these, these two teams play each other pretty frequently because – Bradley and, and Western Illinois and Macomb, not an incredible distance. Bradley won last year, and I, I think Bradley wins again this year. But 
sort of a game you have to take a little more seriously than the Eureka game. Not that you would take the Eureka game lightly, but, you know, it, it's a game where maybe they'll come out and show more of the game plan that they would employ moving forward down into Valley Play and, and so on. So, I don't know, just a, just a game that should be a little closer uh, yeah, in that regard. Just you know, going on with what these guys said, yeah, I mean, they're, they're a better opponent, obviously, than Eureka. I mean, I think you have to take it seriously. But I do still look for Bradley to come out and get a victory and just have a nice little couple stretch of games here to get some confidence back after getting beat by 20 by Michigan. They're now looking at those three teams specifically, all having big games coming up, starting with, uh, I believe we'll start with Drake and Creighton, uh, former MVC foe. A lot of history there. What are some of the thoughts on that game for you guys? Uh, I, for Creighton, you know, they lost senior Aubrey Faber last year, so they're going to have to look to a new cast. I think they're going to rely on uh, seniors Agnew and Elger, senior Olivia Elger. And then as well, I think Tammy Carta is a name that could – provide huge for the Braves. She's a junior this year. She scored double figures last year, scored 25 in their second game against Omaha, so she could look to take a big jump this year as well. The way I see it is Creighton beat South Dakota State. South Dakota State beat Drake. Creighton's going to win the game. I'm going with Drake. I think Drake, you know, they've, they've gotten some looks in the top 25 poll. I just think Drake's good team. It's a good test for them early on in the year, but I like the Bulldogs to come out and, and get the win. Like he was saying, though, Creighton balance scoring. I think that balance scoring is going to show out um, at Drake, you know, because they have the two best players probably in the Valley, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, it's the depth that's really going to take Creighton over the hump. It is a uh, Missouri Valley Conference, I'm trying to think of the word, I, rematch of sorts because Creighton, of course, was in the Valley for, for the longest time. So two programs who, they're somewhat familiar with each other. Perhaps you know. a revisit. Yeah, revisit would be a good word. You know, they've played each other in the past, know each other a little bit. Now, of course, you can't base this match up off what happened in 2010. But uh, it's going to be interesting. I think Drake comes out and gets the win, though. All right, moving on. We have another in-state, um, or excuse me, we have our first in-state matchup between Illinois and Illinois State. Illinois out of the Big Ten, Illinois State, of course, from the Valley. Um, some people view this as kind of, you know, a bad blood match. Um, what are some points you guys have also coming there? I'll hop in here, and I'm going to I'm gonna go with Illinois State in this one. I, I, like, I like the Redbirds to come in and pull off. Uh, you could call it an upset, but I don't think so, because look at Illinois. Since Nancy Fahey took the reins a few years ago, things just haven't clicked for the uh, Illini, and they only won two Big Ten games last year. Now, I know Illinois State was picked sixth in the Valley preseason poll, but, you know, this is a, this is a game you got marked on your calendar. A good chance to come out and make a statement against Illinois Big Ten team. So I like the Redbirds. I think they're going to come out strong and uh, take the State Farm Center in Champaign by storm. You know, Illinois State's had a tough non-conference Tate Maggot um, f picked the first team, preseason f first team. Um, she's really the only player that poses any difficulty to defenses, I think. So Illinois is going to win. I have Illinois as well. They have two 6'2 uh, forwards, senior Allie Andrews, who's coming off back-to-back, -back, who scored double figures in both her games. And then freshman forward uh, Kylie uh, freshman Kennedy Miles as well. She comes out of Walnut, Walnut Hills High School in Ohio. She was a two-time conference player of the year uh, in high school and as well as an All-State Honorable Mention nominee. So I think she so and she she had a double-double in her first college game and she nearly missed one in her second. So that's pretty good production for such a young player. So I think that's going to bode well for Illini down the stretch. Look, I'm from Urbana. I, I know Illinois, and, and I'm aware of the uh, team on my mic flag, but I've got to back the birds in this one. I think it's just it's a good chance for them to come out and get an early win, a statement win. You know, regardless of Illinois could be undefeated in the Big Ten or winless in the Big Ten, it's still Illinois, still a team you want to beat, big spotlight. I like Illinois State to come out and get the job done. I also had Illinois picked in this game, and going back to the previous point, which I forgot to mention, I had Drake picked as well. Um, now coming into our third and final game, as a guy from Iowa, this is a big matchup in the state of Iowa. Don't let anyone tell you different. There's state bragging rights as Drake, you and I, Iowa and Iowa State usually all play each other in the non-conference for bragging rights. And you and I so far has done two of the three right now. And they'll be taking on Iowa here coming up. So you and I and Iowa in, uh, excuse me, at you and I, what are uh, some points and emphasis that you guys have there? I think one of the big things you worry about is, you know, you graduate, when you have such a good team and you graduate talent, what's it going to be like? The next year, Iowa went to the Elite Eight last year, was one of the best teams in the country, had one of the best, if not the best player in the country in Megan Gustafson. She's gone. She's drafted. She got picked by the Dallas Wings in the 2019 draft. You lost Tanya Davis as well as Hannah Stewart. The only player they really have left is Kathleen Doyle, but she stepped up so far in early for Iowa. I have them 
pick. I have them defeating uh, Northern Iowa. I'm going to agree with you, Brock. You know, Doyle picked to first team in the coaches poll and the media poll. Mm -hmm. um, she's going to really just bring Iowa up there and, and beat Northern Iowa. Yeah, no such uh, Valley Big Ten upsets here. I, I like Iowa in this one for the reasons that you guys mentioned. And we're going to make it a four-peat sweep with the Hawkeyes. I took Iowa as well on the road against UNI as Iowa will stop UNI streak to be the uh, in-state favorite, we should say there. Any uh, last points from you guys here? I mean, UNI is, is a legit team, though, so it'll be a close, hard-fought game. It's not going to be a blowout, I don't think. Yeah, it's one of those matchups where – you know, you pick one team, Iowa in this case, but you're not surprised if, if Iowa, Northern Iowa, I should say, can come out and pull off the win. So if it's close, if it's within 10 points, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, especially, yeah, with, the, with much of the talent they have. I mean, with Carly Rucker and Megan Moss, I mean, it's, it's not going to be a pushover game. I mean, Iowa's got to take it seriously. They can't just come in thinking they're going to roll them because they're in the Valley. They are a legitimate opponent. And it, it should be a good game. I don't think it'll be a blowout by any means, but I do think that Iowa has the edge. All great points. And you guys here to hear first on the Braves Vision Pre-game show live from, or excuse me, from Renaissance Coliseum here in Peoria, Illinois, on the campus of Bradley University.